Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Faris Chadid. I mean, he's uh, the head of uh, neonatology at Kanad Hospital. And all of you know him. He has been in UAE as a great academician. He was in Tawam Hospital. He was a head in Al Jalila Hospital where he established the NICU. And now he's with Kanad, which is a fairly busy unit, similar to our unit as well. And uh, it's very important that he speaks to us about chronic intermittent hypoxia in the premature infants. It's one of the intriguing concepts now. None of us are really sure about what it holds for the future of these babies. And one of the important tools to recognize it is the saturation histogram. So uh, he's going to brief us on his experience in introducing it as well. And hopefully it will help us introduce it in our unit uh, and it will help others as well. So uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Faris. Thank you for accepting this and uh, very nice of you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Sridhar. Thank you very much. Nice being with you. It's a good idea to communicate and have uh, those uh, conferences between uh, different institutions like now. So my talk today will be about bedside uh, histogram and chronic intermittent hypoxia in preterm infants. It's not going down. Ah, no, it's fine. All right. I have no conflicts of interest, as you see, no strings attached. My objectives for the talk will be to understand the chronic intermittent hypoxia in preterm infant. What is it? How to quantify it with trends and histograms? How common it is? How significant? Why does it happen? And how can we prevent it? So uh, we, all of us, when we do our rounds in the morning, uh, we uh, hear that this baby had six or seven desaturations throughout the days. They keep having those very short desaturation with normal, with return to normoxia. That's intermittent hypoxia. When you have that desat followed by normoxia. And then when it happens over many weeks in, during the stay of NICU, we call it chronic intermittent hypoxia. Those hypoxia don't uh, reach to be, be called apnea because uh, they're not 20 seconds of cessation of breathing or 15 seconds with bradycardia. So they are just desaturations. So I'll give you examples. We introduced ourselves the bedside histogram not long ago, maybe five weeks ago, not much longer because we bought the equipment. And uh, the, all the pictures which I will show you here were taken last week from our patients presently still in the NICU. So here is bed 14, patient in bed 14. Uh, the patient has hypoxia and hyperoxia. This is a 24 weeks baby, 610 gram with ductus arteriosus that was treated initially with ibuprofen. And you see the how edematous is the lung. And then later on, uh, since it didn't respond to ibuprofen, we treated with paracetamol. I know the argument about should we treat or not treat PDA, but uh, considering that chest X-ray, we treated uh, it. And the patient on about two weeks of life had, as you see on the, uh, the other part of the screen, a necrotizing enterocolitis. So at the moment when he had the necrotizing enterocolitis, we, uh, he started having desaturation. You can see down in the, on the left side of the screen, you see the nurses records. They show three, six, and two, eight desaturations. M many publications showed that the uh, nurses record will underestimate by far the number of desaturations. If you look at the trend, you do the trend from the, from the monitor and you find that the baby had many more desaturations than eight. And also the nurses record usually don't explain clearly how long remain those desaturations. At the same time, I don't see in the nurse's record any hyperoxia. Well, hyperoxia, we try to avoid it. It can cause, uh, as you know, ROP and other uh, pro-oxidant uh, harms. See here, the value 95, our aim is to remain below 95% saturation in this baby. You have many peaks above 95. The baby was going from hypoxia to hyperoxia many, many times, and we did not have any records of the hyperoxia. So uh, bedside trends and histogram will tell us, uh, will show us those uh, desats and hyperoxia. The histogram, what is it? The histogram is a summary of the trend. It summarizes for you how many, uh, 
let me move this away. Okay, it summarizes for you uh, how many times the patient, how many minutes the patient stayed during a specific period of time out of the target. So here I selected myself the duration is 12 hours. So 52, half of the time, which is about uh, six hours of those 12 hours, the patient was only in target. But one quarter of the time, which is three hours, and one quarter of the time, another three hours, he remained either below the target or above the target. Our target is 90 to 95, but I try, I wanted to collect uh, 88 to 96 for the data to be significant. So even if we look further, we find that 14% uh, of the time, he was having quite a deep descent, below 85%. So histogram, if you're taking a histogram of 24 hours, 1% of 24 hours is about 15 minutes. 4% is one hour. When you're taking a histogram of 12 hours, 1% is seven minutes, all right? So uh, this is uh, how histogram, what histogram shows. Now on that same baby, since he has a, uh, he didn't look like, he didn't have hypotension, but it doesn't mean because we don't have hypotension that the tissue is well perfused. Normally when you go clinically, you press on the chest to, to make it uh, bleached, and then you take out your finger to check the reperfusion time, which should be less than three seconds. Here is the pulsatility index, which is the examination of the perfusion of that baby who is having neck. The normal value of pulsatility index is between 0.4 and 3. And we see that 99% uh, of the time, baby was between uh, the tar was within the target. That is good. Uh, the pulsatility index is the ratio of the pulsatile blood to non-pulsatile blood. So it expresses the perfusion of baby. It was suggested as a screening tool for PDA. So because PDA had more often a pulsatility index below 0.4, below target. Also, as you know, for the screening of CCHD, critical congenital heart diseases, we know that the ones that we miss are the left heart obstructive lesion, like coarctation of aorta, left hypoplast. They are missed one third of the time. Sensitivity is 65%. So um, people suggested to add the pulsatility index to increase the sensitivity for left heart lesions, which would cause a low pulsatility index. Also, I just read a publication 2021 uh, expressing that the additive value of the pulsatility index for CCHD is very low, okay? Also, a patient who's in shock might be having vasodilated shock, distributive shock. In such cases, you may have a high pulsatility index above three while the patient is shocked. So pulsatility index is important to, to look at. So this is a patient here, uh, to bed 12. I moved from bed, uh, bed to 14 to bed 12. This patient had tachypnea without desaturation. When you look at him, this was a 26 weeks, 900 grammar, who's gone out of the loop. Now he's 34 weeks, ready to go home. The patient, as many of them would have at that time, anemia with 8.8 .8 hemoglobin, but we didn't transfuse because he was in room air. At the same time, he was 1.5 liter per minute. Not only that, he was producing nice amount of reticulocyte, 8.8%. So this patient, 1.5 liter per minute, you look at his histogram, he is below target only 2%. The magic uh, number is 20. It's not big based on studies, but based on expert opinion. They say 20% below target or above target is acceptable as a, as a range but we shouldn't accept more than 20% below target, especially if it is below target, near the target. So now this patient was 42% above target, above 96% saturation, but I don't worry at all about that. I'd like him to be all the time above 96% because he's in room air. So a patient who's in room air, we're very happy that his uh, histogram will shift to your right hand side toward the high saturation since he's not having oxygen. But when he's having oxygen, I wanted to stay within target. So this patient, we were talking about why not weaning him and uh, prepare him for home. So we looked at the histogram for respiration 
And we found that the baby is breathing 42% of the time above 60 per minute. So 38% uh, between 60 and 80 and above 80%, uh, which is uh, some sort of severe tachypnea, 4% of the time. So what to do? I don't know what to do because nobody tells us with the histogram what to do. But I said, well, he might need increased support. So I increased the flow from one and a half liter while I was thinking of weaning based on the, the saturation histogram. I was planning to wean. But because of that tachypnea, 42% of the time, I increased to six liter per minute and uh, I made sure like iron therapy is uh, in therapeutic dose. And I was thinking and hoping that tomorrow I will show everyone like, look the difference. But well, unfortunately, next day and the following days, the six liter per minute didn't make any difference. The patient remained with beautiful saturation, but uh, with tachypnea nearly the same amount up and down. So the action didn't make a difference. So we kept that action of six liter per minute for I think one week or so. Uh, and then now uh, yesterday I was there, I said, look, uh, whatever I did hoping to work, it didn't work and we wanna plant that baby for home. I started the weaning despite the tachypnea. So uh, by having the histogram, sometimes it brings you more questions than uh, answers, but uh, also thinking. So this patient, I was thinking I would improve his tachypnea by increasing respiratory support. It didn't make a difference. But one point relevant to that patient, what's happening, sorry for that. Uh, okay. That patient, as I told you, was having saturation beautiful all the time. When you look at the trend, you find that, you look at the trend, there is 90% here on the left. So he's all the time above 90%. And because we're not, we're not giving oxygen, we don't mind if he's touching 100% many times. So this patient all the time on the trend, he's beautiful. But uh, because we ask it, our nurses now, and they report in their daily sheet uh, twice a day, every shift they will take uh, after 12 hourly, they take the histogram and they report to the next nurse and to the physician when there is something. So the nurse coming in the evening at 6 p.m., she, she did the histogram and she found that the patient was from 12 o'clock till uh, 6, 7 p.m., 6 p.m. He was having desaturations which he didn't have before. So uh, she suctioned him and he was having a quite a thick mucus plug. Once suctioned, he returned back, as you see on the right-hand side, to beautiful saturation above 90%. So uh, it's nice to, those trends and histogram uh, gives you idea sometime about changes over time. For the same patient, uh, you can do histogram for anything and trends the same way. Here it's a histogram of his heart rate, which is uh, all the time in the target and uh, the trend shows the same. You can, if you have arterial blood pressure monitoring, CVP or anything, you can do the histogram for it. So we finished with the, uh, those two patients, I'll go to a third patient. I have to move the pictures of people from left to right. So, okay, bed 18. This is a patient who had hypoxia and hyperoxia that remain both of them chronic, but didn't have any tachypnea. Uh, so this patient uh, is a 25 weeker, um, and now he's corrected age 32 weeks. He didn't have really major lung problem, but yes, he, he required ventilation. Initially, he remained on CPAP, then required ventilation. And while he was, and then extubated to BiPAP, 23% uh, oxygen. The point is that when he was receiving ventilation around 18 to 20 PIP, that was a baby who was totally well and uh, uh, brain ultrasound normal, but straining all the time. And then uh, during those episodes of straining, he goes down to uh, quite low in saturation. And then he goes up, nurse increases oxygen a little bit, and then the, he jumps up to 100%. The patient was on 40% oxygen to 30, 30 to 40% oxygen. So patient on 30 to 40% oxygen, you don't want hypoxia or hyperoxia. While in here, like the previous baby, he was only 50% of the time within target, 24% below target, 26% above target.
See this picture while well, he was ventilated. Here is the picture after extubation, but that was totally the same picture during intubation ventilation. So uh, surely we go to the nurse. We say, please, uh, he's at high risk of ROP. This patient, because both hypoxia and hyperoxia cause ROP. Please make sure to be really diligent and present near the baby. Increase and decrease oxygen. Uh, and they did all their best, but uh, uh, it didn't work. So at some stage, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, it's dangerous having that uh, so much hypoxia, hyperoxia. And just to learn for myself and to see if I can help baby, I gave him, while well, he didn't need it so much by the ventilator requirement, I switched him from conventional to high frequency. He was already on fentanyl for mics, so well sedated on caffeine. I switched him to high frequency, so, hoping that I can control those training and he would let it go, let go, which he did beautifully. Very quickly, he improved and uh, came to have maybe 10% below target, 5-10% above target, and really most of it was within the range of 1995. So I was so happy that we succeeded with the high frequency moving him, but at some stage, we need to progress toward extubation. He had a dart doses of dexamethasone and then got extubated. Immediately after extubation, he recurred. He came back to what he was having as histogram before with the same very wide histogram, lots of DSAT, lots of hyperoxia. And uh, one week ago, they diagnosed ROP stage, uh, ROP. And yesterday, before yesterday, they uh, had to do Lucentis injection because the ROP increased from what I wrote here, stage two became stage three, zone one to two. So as expected, we knew that he might have that ROP. We tried our best to get rid of it, to avoid it, but we were not able to avoid it. That shows you the limit of what you read on histogram. You see that baby after extubation while he's having DSAT and uh, hyperoxia, his, heart, his respiratory rate was 100% within target. He wasn't a kipnik. So let's progress. So um, now what does an optimal histogram look like? You know already, if the patient is receiving oxygen, like on left-hand side here, he's receiving oxygen, you don't want hypoxia or hyperoxia. You'd like to be, uh, you'd like histogram to be in the middle between 1995-96. But if your patient is having, um, that will reduce mortality, ROP, BPD. But if your patient, uh, I'm having some problem. Yeah, if your patient is in room air, you'd like your histogram to be shifted to the right-hand side where to hyperoxia. I see this patient. He's 100% of the time above 90% and maybe some 50% of the time above 95, 96. I'm very happy about it because he's in room air. So we, I hope you get a uh, idea about the histograms and trends and how they can help to quantify uh, the, the events of hypoxia, hyperoxia. Now, how common is chronic intermittent hypoxia? You see, the frequency depends on your definition of hypoxia. If we say we want to capture only those below 85, then we have less frequency than if we put our, uh, yes, our limit is always 90 to 95 uh, for preterm babies, extreme preterms, but uh, we might want to capture those below 88 or those below 85 to call them chronic intermittent hypoxia. The definition affects the frequency. The postnatal age also is very relevant. You see on the graph, this is a graph showing us the number of hypoxic events per week. So on the x-axis is week one, week two, week three, and so on till week eight. On the y-axis, you see how many times per, per week the patient had hypoxia. We see from the graph that first one to two weeks of life, we have much less hypoxia, uh, possibly and many reviews or studies have shown the same, possibly because the patient has still fetal hemoglobin, which uh, is greedy of oxygen, so you kept saturating well even when his, when the tissue is hypoxic. So also the patient is usually having a non-damaged lung at this stage still, and uh, he's having, as I said, fetal hemoglobin. So later on, and he's less active usually. 
but uh, because he's on so much sedations and uh, maybe morphine, fentanyl. So, but when the patient reach four to five weeks or four to six weeks of age, you reach a peak of uh, hypoxic event. Look at it, it's about 650 per week, which is nearly 100 desaturations per day. None of us have seen a nursing record showing 100 desaturations per day, but it is common. So, um, why? Because now the lung is damaged, it's adult hemoglobin, and the patient is more active, maybe less sedated at four or five weeks of age, extubated. Then later on, it will decrease. So, um, this is a postnatal age affect affecting the frequency. How does the percent of hemoglobin F affect, I would say, the tissue? There is a uh, systematic review done in 2021. Uh, as you see, many, many uh, articles uh, tried to include, but at the end, they found four studies that were relevant to, the, to it. Uh, as you see, uh, fetal hemoglobin has a very high affinity to oxygen. That means uh, it doesn't give oxygen to the tissue. So if you don't give oxygen to the tissue, you might have normal saturation, but less tissue oxygenation. So they tried to find uh, by near, near infrared spectroscopy in these four studies, if uh, the percent of fraction of hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin, F is fraction, so the, or the proportion of fetal hemoglobin versus total hemoglobin, how much does it affect the fraction of oxygen extraction in the brain or the uh, muscle? They found in those four studies, well, the brain ox extraction of oxygen is not affected by the proportion of fetal hemoglobin but the extraction of oxygen from the muscle is affected, is increased when you have more fetal hemoglobin. How much is relevant to chronic intermittent hypoxia? I don't know, but uh, it is a relevant point that whether your baby is fetal hemoglobin or adult hemoglobin. So now we, uh, uh, we would like to know how, uh, what problem do they bring, you know? What problem do we have from that? So oxygen, we all know since 70 years ago, since the 1950 and the blindness that happened due to oxygen, we know that uh, oxygen is a devil. So, uh, and here is a study showing uh, in the X, X axis, the postnatal aging week and how many hyperoxic event here. And those who had laser ROP versus those who had no laser or no ROP, certainly they had more hyperoxic event. So oxygen is a devil, but if oxygen is a devil, that doesn't mean that uh, that doesn't mean that hypoxia is an angel. So here is the same picture, even more significant, showing that uh, the rate of laser ROP is increased in patients who had more hypoxic events. So it's even worse when you have a hypoxic event and hyperoxic event like the patient in the same patient as the one I showed you before. So again, about the significance of hypoxia, we said that uh, uh, the hypoxia and hyperoxia, both of them are significant for the outcome. There are many factors that are relevant. The timing of event, as I will show you now, the number, duration, and depth of those events, and is the patient having at the same time problem of oxygen carrying capacity like anemia, hypoxemia, hypoperfusion, and uh, hyperoxia. So here is about the timing of the hypoxia. You can see that the, the hypoxia cause problem more when different problems at different stages. They divided it here in three phases. In phase one, hypoxia causes IVH, causes chronic lung disease, causes cognitive delay, but the hypoxia immediately after birth is not the one causing ROP. That's a hypoxia that happened around one month of age and forward when the vessels started to grow where the ROP will happen. You have some with two phases like the BPD and the IVH. So timing of hypoxia affects the outcome. Now, the duration and depth of hypoxia are relevant. This is a very large study because uh, it come, it's a post hoc analysis from the COT trial, Canadian Oxygen trial. That was a trial who was trying to compare 
uh, 85 to 90 versus 90 to 95 saturation to answer the question whether we can reduce the rate of ROP by selecting a target 85 to 90. And they demonstrated in the COD trial that we reduce ROP, but we increased mortality and some um, cognitive problems. So the recommendation is still 90 to 95 for most units. But the post hoc analysis demonstrated, uh, they recalculated, counted the number of hypoxic event and they found that uh, there is an association, this is a relative risk association between hypoxic event and uh, death or disability, cognitive delay, motor impairment with a relative risk of 3.5, that's 250% increase, and also severe ROP, which would need laser, it's nearly two. So uh, this says that hypoxic event are relevant. We can't come and say, don't worry, baby is not having apnea. Uh, let's continue. No, no, hypoxia is relevant, but now what to do about it? That's a problem. I'll give you here uh, uh, to discuss the other issue. It's not only the hypoxic event, what comes with it as anemia, hypoperfusion. So here is a patient that had some certain neuro and um, uh, some uh, epilepsy plus lung agenesis. We have the gene for that disease. Whatever it is, the patient unfortunately died last weekend. He was six months old. Uh, we managed his um, problems initially, but remained in hospital and was to go to California. What happened, uh, he, the only lung he has, which is the left lung, got severe pneumonia in it, as you can see in the right-hand picture. So, and he was in severe shock, received every treatment that you could treat for shock. And at some stage he had improved and we had weaned uh, dopamine, dobutamine. He was still only on epinephrine and norepinephrine. And now his mean arterial pressure was beautiful, 80. So I thought, you know, let's look at the pulsatility index to see if that 80 of uh, blood pressure is perfusion well the body or it was just producing such an alpha effect with little perfusion to the periphery. So the histogram shows interestingly here that uh, the patient uh, had 41% perfusion index below the target. That means, you know, uh, we are happy with the number of 80 millimeter mercury, but the tissue is not happy. So uh, do I act about it? I thought, you know, I don't wanna play with a game that I don't understand well. I, I said, let's continue weaning on the way we usually wean. Uh, inotropes without acting based on the pulsatility index. You might act it or not act it, but I didn't act based on the pulsatility index. I said, keep doing what you're doing as weaning process, uh, not to play with something I don't understand. So what happened after, they uh, we weaned him normally out of epinephrine. And then I did a histogram when epinephrine was off. That was only a few hours later and uh, the histogram was 100% within target. So it's relevant when we treat a shock, not to only know is it distributive shock or vasoconstrictive shock, but also to see the effect of what you give as medicine on the perfusion index. Now, when you see it, what to do about it, it's another question. Another interesting case that I had, a 24 week or 760 grammar out of the loop and now to go home but had the chronic lung disease so confirmed pulmonary hypertension and treated with sildenafil so after treatment with sildenafil for only the interest of it i thought let's see the uh, sildenafil is a vasodilator let's see the pulsatility index and very interesting that the pulsatility index showed 11 percent above target does it mean is it caused by the sildenafil? Would it mean that the sildenafil is vasodilating the pulmonary vessel as much as it's vasodilating the peripheral vessel? But uh, it's a relevant finding. So whenever we give sildenafil to try to learn by looking at the PI index histogram. So now I progress towards the end of my talk, but uh, uh, we wonder why do we have uh, those hypoxia happening so often? Uh, and uh, what happens when we get them. So why does it happen? I have four theories that are the most prevalent theories. 
One of them is the imbalance between peripheral and central chemoreceptors. We'll talk about it. Second one is low CO2 apneic threshold in preterm baby, the pro-inflammatory cascade and other causes of TSAT. Hope you're not tired already, but uh, to uh, revive those who start to feel hungry or tired, you have 1,000 dirham. This is my suggestion. Then if you are five answering, you'll get 5,000. 10 answering, 10,000 dirham. So my question to you, uh, this is a chicken egg question. Uh, which one comes first? Is it the tachypnea? This, are, this is a patient on periodic breathing. So classically we say, uh, like you have a tachypnea, uh, you have an apnea of 10 seconds, 12 seconds, and the apnea of up to 20, 10 seconds is followed by compensatory tachypnea. Or is it that the tachypnea is causing the apnea? Which one comes first, the chicken or the egg? Is the tachypnea preceding to the apnea? I wouldn't call it apnea, to the period of cessation of breathing for the periodic breathing. Is it tachypnea before cessation of breathing or is it cessation of breathing before tachypnea? Any answer from the team? You can put your speaker up if you have an answer. What we would go you say? for the uh, hypoxia happening first and then the tachypnea as a compensatory response. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sridhar. Anyone else would like to also give a suggestion which one comes first? I would vote for the same answer. You vote for the same. The I mean, other... uh, the, the periodic breathing, um, the apnea, and then compensated by tachypnea. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, anyone else wants to make money? So that's honestly, Dr. Sridhar, what I, Dr. Sridhar and Dr. Muhammad, what I used to think. But this is not true. I'll explain it. What happens is the tachypnea preceding the apnea. It's not, it doesn't seem logic, but you'll understand it clearly from the second two slides, from the two slides that come below. So the tachypnea comes before the apnea, not the apnea before the tachypnea. And let's see why. So here is the adult control of breathing. The explanation will come in the next slide. But in adult, there is a good uh, uh, coordination between the peripheral chemoreceptor and central chemoreceptor. So the peripheral chemoreceptor, you see it on your right hand side, Peripheral chemoreceptors are sensitive to hypoxia and acidosis, low PO2, low pH. And those chemoreceptors are present in the cross of the aorta and carotid bodies. So when you have hypoxia, high, uh, low, low pH, they will fire very quickly to the brainstem to order the brainstem to breathe. At the same time, the high CO2 will go to the brain. In the brain, there is all over the brain, there are chemoreceptors for high CO2. And those chemoreceptors will fire uh, also chemical products down to the brainstem to breathe. So you have two orders coming at the same time. One from the peripheral chemoreceptor and one from the central chemoreceptor telling the brain to breathe or when you have low CO2 to decrease the rate of breathing and so on. So there is no discordance in adults between peripheral and central chemoreceptor. What will happen in the preterm babies? In the preterm babies, the peripheral chemoreceptor are much, much more powerful and more, more quick to act than the central chemoreceptor. What will happen, you have a slightly low PO2, slightly low pH, chemoreceptor in the periphery work much quicker, much stronger. The brain stem start to breathe fast they will stimulate the brainstem and the patient start breathing. Breathing will cause CO2 to go a little down. When the CO2 goes a little down, immediately after it will inhibit now the central chemoreceptor. By inhibiting the central chemoreceptor, it will inhibit the brainstem center of breathing and then the patient will get apnea. So this is why, contrary to what I honestly, I used to think myself, I used to think, uh, a patient stops breathing because his brain is not mature and then immediately after he compensates by tachypnea. No, this is not what happens. You have the chemoreceptors from the periphery will stimulate the brain to breathe. The, it breathes fast and this will cause the apnea because breathing fast will lower CO2 and causes periodic breathing. Tachypnea before apnea. So uh, Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Sridhar, can you get the, give the others 
every 1,000 dirham. Okay, so, so I just have a question. So to start with, why this baby had low BO2 then um, to stimulate the chemoreceptor? Yes. So From the beginning. It, it is not a low, it's a good question. I, I don't know if the answer will be satisfactory. The other but, point is also that, I mean, hypoxia causes apnea in the small babies. So, I mean, if you look at the pathophysiology yes, of apnea, yes. they have a paradoxical response to hypoxia. So, it's still not solved. So, nobody gives anyone money. <laughs> Fair enough. Khalas, you're saved from that. But the point is, we're not talking here about true hypoxia, which can cause apnea, yes. We're not talking about true hypoxia. We're talking about this very slight variation of the oxygen or pH below the level to say that it's abnormal. This is like our brain, our peripheral chemoreceptor. Maybe your PO2 will go down uh, from uh, uh, just within normal, just slightly down. And that will stimulate the brain stem to breathe before the center of the brain think of it. So it is not hypoxia per se. I called it hypoxia. It's a slight reduction in PO2, slight reduction in pH. Now, what happened to cause those, I, uh, I would say, I don't know that uh, many reasons for which the baby will have a slight drop of, uh, minimal drop of O2 that wouldn't be seen to your eye or to the monitor to anything. But this is at least one strong theory about periodic breathing and desaturations. Uh, the imbalance between peripheral and central chemoreceptor, and they detected that in uh, in rats, something like 2005, or uh, so it is, uh, they, they studied it uh, well, and then they studied it in newborn infant. So, Dr. Ramper, so what will happen if we give uh, babies who had frequent TSAT, um, if we give them like um, a little bit of oxygen? then we will stop the periodic breathing, right? We go yeah. to continuous regular breathing and then yeah. we'll avoid the desat. You know, um, you, many questions are intelligent questions, but uh, I wouldn't be able to answer them because I wouldn't, uh, I see your point. Uh, like I give you the example to answer partially your question. My patient who had uh, uh, all the time hypoxia and hyperoxia, uh, when he showed ROP stage two already and zone one to two, and I was worried then he progressed for uh, ROP stage three, which uh, he progressed to and had resentence then. Our ophthalmologist, he's your ophthalmologist as well. He asked me at that time to, uh, to target maybe 94, 96 of saturation rather than 90, 94 to avoid the hypoxia because uh, when you have already ROP, hypoxia exaggerate the ROP. So we did that, it didn't make a difference, but uh, uh, so to your question, if we give oxygen, what will happen? Uh, the problem is if you give oxygen, it might put him in hyperoxia, but I see in many expert opinion, patient with frequent hypoxia, they recommend to increase oxygen to 23, 24% oxygen. We're not talking about 40% oxygen, hoping that 22, 23, 24% oxygen will not bring them to the toxic hyperoxic effect of, uh, of high saturation. This is partial answer because uh, there is no literature to answer your questions. So I have the same questions like you. I would say, yes, as you see in the recommendation below, give slight little bit of oxygen 23, 22, but not to any baby. And we, nobody would recommend for periodic breathing uh, to give oxygen for now. But if you start having very prolonged and frequent hypoxia, you might give 22-23%. Can I progress? So I already explained two, theory, two theories. One of them uh, was, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the imbalance between central and uh, peripheral chemoreceptor. Another one is the low low CO2 threshold. In adult, the difference between, uh, is it fine? You're with me, huh? So in adult, uh, you can't cause a patient to, by asking him to breathe fast, you cannot cause him to be apneic, honestly, because there is five millimeter mercury between the apneic CO2 threshold and the apneic CO2 threshold. He has to breathe so fast to go down by more than five to reach the apneic threshold. 
in very preterm, preterm babies, uh, the apneic CO2 threshold and apneic threshold are really touching each other. It's only difference of 1.5 millimeter mercury. So you can be um, uh, 40 of CO2, you go down to 38 and you start having uh, apnea. So um, you go below the threshold and it causes you apnea and desaturations. So one of them is central chem preferred chemoreceptors are uh, in, in, not in balance with central chemoreceptor. Second one is a low CO2 threshold. Third one is a pro-oxidant cascade. Prematurity and inflammation cause, uh, prematurity often comes with infection and causes inflammation. And all of this will go damage the lung in addition to our ventilation, which damage the lung. Not only that, it will cause further impairment of uh, the peripheral and central chemoreceptor. Both factors will cause intermittent hypoxia. The hypoxia itself will open a cascade by inducing pro-inflammatory uh, pro-oxidant cascade, which uh, increases the secretion of cytokines and uh, oxidative stress. And all of this become a, a closed circuit um, the cause become the effect and the effect becomes the cause. So uh, causing the harm. Last uh, slide about uh, why it happens. Immature baby have small lung, small functional residual capacity, small oxygen stores. They, are, uh, have, they have apnea of prematurity. They have fetal hemoglobin. And on top of that, we damage their lungs and the damaged uh, chronic lung disease has less pulmonary stores of oxygen. It's associated with pulmonary hypertension and often anemia, so many factors. So I know you're tired now, I go to the, my, my last point. How can we treat slash prevent uh, chronic intermittent hypoxia? And there is no real literature about it to say how. You have experts speaking and you try yourself and you find what you did as I showed you in a few patients, in two patients, I, I, I did what I think is correct, but didn't make a difference. So certainly make sure like your caffeine dose is increased uh, with the patient weight and maybe go up to 15 milligram kg. And uh, I heard many people uh, uh, in different international meetings saying, okay, my patient didn't have apnea for the last uh, two, three weeks. So uh, why should we keep a drug that's not needed? Well, wrong, because uh, if you want to decrease caffeine, stop caffeine, I would say you don't stop it because he doesn't ap have apnea. You stop it because you keep it probably till 30, 32 weeks. And then you think of stopping it. You look at uh, the histogram and the trends and number of apneas if there are apneas. So if you have this favorable histogram and no apneas, then it's time to decrease it. Not because he didn't have apnea. Optimize respiratory support, go up from what you're having or go down based on uh, uh, your histogram. Now again, the CPAP, moving from CPAP to high flow nasal cannula. One, uh, there is clear literature from Australia, Melbourne and uh, different places in Australia that uh, CPAP is better than high flow nasal cannula. So when should we move? But they showed that uh, uh, at initial treatment, CPAP is better than high flow nasal cannula, but at uh, weaning, CPAP is equal to high flow nasal cannula. These are non-inferiority trials. So my suggestion recommendation would say to keep the CPAP till at least 30 weeks. And then when you think of going from CPAP to high flow nasal cannula, you wouldn't do it when you're still above 0.3 of FiO2. You, you look at the favorable histogram for respiratory rate and SpO2, and also the work of breathing you, the nurses keep moving the patient from nasal cannula to mask to nasal cannula to mask. So he will have short times of CPAP. So the nurse will tell you when I take him off CPAP, he immediately deteriorated. So it's telling you it's too early to take out CPAP. So it is too blunt to come and say, okay, he's doing well with CPAP. Let's move to high flow nasal cannula. Look at the histogram at the work of breathing as the nurses, how does he tolerate off CPAP? I tried... We bought four ventilators. I tried what's called PRICO, intelligent control of oxygenation, uh, meaning the ventilator itself will increase FiO2, decrease FiO2 according to, this, to the saturation. 
well, we tried it, but the ventilator that they gave us, the company, uh, wasn't measuring the saturation correctly and all the process was wrong. So they were in a rush to sell us ventilators. So at the end, and we needed, so we bought the ventilators without the automatic control of oxygenation. But it's a good theory that let the ventilator increase and decrease oxygen all day long. Uh, certainly watch on other factors that are associated, if associated with hypoxia, would cause problem like uh, hyperoxia, anemia, uh, local satility index. Last two slides, I will not go through them because it's another subject, but I would suggest uh, they say that uh, look at respiratory rate and SpO2. The magic number is 20%. A patient who is having less than 20% respiratory rate above 60, they define it as no tachypnea. And also when he desaturates less than 88 for less than 20% of the time or less than 85 for less than 15% of the time. So when his saturation is uh, below 20% desat and below 20% tachypnea, he's fine, he's green, you can start weaning. Also, when he has a mild tachypnea, 60 to 80 without desat, you might talk of weaning. But if he has, like in the red zone here, tachypnea above 80 for more than 20% of the time, associated with desat, you have to increase support. And in between those with tachypnea without desat or desat without tachypnea, you have uh, um, keep same or increase support based on your work of breathing and other aspect. Also, I suggest that for every unit to create their own protocol, not to have every physician according to his own experience, weaning or escalating treatment. When should we wean from an IPPV to CPAP? When to wean from CPAP to high flow or go up and how to go up? So it's a, uh, it has to be an agreement in the team. And uh, so everyone does in a way the same, how uh, nearly the same. Before last slide, in summary, chronic intermittent hypoxia is common in very preterm, very low birth weight infant. It promotes a pro-inflammatory pro-oxidant cascade leading to short and long-term mortality and morbidity as we showed you. Histogram and trends may be um, may be uh, used, not sued, <laughs> may be used to identify and quantify hypoxic and hyperoxic event. They also can be used to guide weaning and escalation of support. But start, uh, we need to remember that we don't know much about this subject and there is not enough uh, evidence in the literature to tell you what to do. So it's a bit like in this picture, those people are walking their invisible dog so you don't want to unleash an invisible dog because that invisible dog could be like the ROP in the past, which caused so much blindness. So that invisible dog, you want to know if this is uh, this dog on the left or that dog on the right before you unleash it. Okay. Thank you very much. Any question, any yeah, of comment? Course we have uh, many questions and it will be a fascinating discussion for sure. So, but not ans no answers I suspect. No, I mean, I'm sure we all have some answer. Whether it's the right answer, we don't know. So do you want to stop uh, sharing the screen? Now? Yes, let me um, escape here. Uh, where is it here? This is the top, I mean, uh, stop. Yes, stop try to, to... To show stop sharing? Or? Yes, yes, but I have to go back to open up... Uh, the, to enlarge the screen so I can have it. Uh, it. Once again, if you don't mind, I am so clumsy. Stop share, now it came. Good, thank you. I mean, it was an amazing uh, lecture and it's very nice to do it this way in a relaxed atmosphere because there's no time pressure of uh, having the... Thank you, I'll make a pen one second. Yeah, yeah, please. Sure. Pen and the... Yes, uh, sorry for that, you know, to just uh, hear the question well. Yes, thank you. I mean, uh, obviously, very important topic. I mean, chronic intermittent hypoxia is a very important topic. Whether the histogram is going to change our approach, I don't know. As you rightly said in the end, I mean, that's the most important point. And the dog, the one that is roaring, could be a medical legal problem. 
I mean, because we are arbitrarily putting a cutoff of 20%, which may or may not be the correct one. And later people may, if they have a record in hand, it's worse than having just the nursing documentation. I mean, we have an apnea chart, for example, and we know what we are documenting, but here we are going to record something for life, which will be available to the courts later, which we don't know what exactly to do with. So I think it's better to wait for the clear cut updates on what saturation. I mean, any saturation, if you say 20% below 88 is acceptable, how much below 80 is acceptable? I mean, I wouldn't take any saturation below 80, hopefully. But again, that point will come up. I mean, you showed in some of the slides that 8% below 80% was there. So how do we manage these babies? And coming to the point about Abu Halwa's comment on oxygen, I mean, obviously, if the baby goes below 80%, we need to give more oxygen. But is it just oxygen the baby needs or the pressure that the baby needs? Again, that debate is a clinical question. The last summary that you put about the action plan, um, most of the time I was thinking clinically, we would do the same. I mean, you look at the baby, if there is increased work of breathing, if the baby looks tachypneic, we increase the pressure. So that's what I'm trying to discuss with the nurses and the team, empower them that there is a pressure change, the baby needs more pressure, increase the flow as needed. So one question is about the pathogenesis that we discussed of chronic intermittent hypoxia and the timing. Obviously we discussed many factors in the first two weeks, it's less because the baby is on more support, probably the fetal hemoglobin is high and majority of these babies need transfusion after that period. But we also have progressing feeds in these babies and we discussed recently about what do we do with uh, respiratory support in babies on significant progressing feeds because these are small babies, say we are only talking of the extreme preterms, less than one kilo babies. And when their stomach is distending, it's going to affect their uh, respiratory uh, physiology because the diaphragm is going up. And what happens with the brief episodes of breath holding or the apnea or whatever we call it? I mean, the functional residual capacity is going to drop more. Is the baby going to recover on their own or is it going to need more support? And that's why when we uh, spoke recently in our unit about weaning the pressure, I mean, you... Uh, you gave a pattern of continuing CPAP longer. We tend to come off the CPAP at the earliest possible that the baby would tolerate because of the nasal trauma mainly. We are using the high flow once the baby is on less than 0.3, I fully agree, but we don't put a gestation cutoff for that. We move to high flow when they are like uh, stable uh, on CPAP of four to five centimeters and their gases are stable. If they were to below 30%, then we move to high flow as a trial or we give the CPAP with the high flow interface to start with or a RAM cannula. And then if they tolerate it, we continue to wean because it's a bigger benefit for the baby if they can tolerate it. And of course, we don't uh, hesitate to escalate them back to the CPAP or NAPPV if they don't tolerate. So the question of when to wean the high flow came up. And the point I was making is that in a very small baby where their ability to recruit their lung is limited because of their size and due to other factors, we shouldn't wean the pressure below a certain level, say three to four liters on high flow till they are bigger than one kilo, for example. So uh, not to rush weaning the pressure fully off, but that, that small amount of pressure might help to keep the functional residual capacity and might reduce these intermittent episodes. Similarly, what Abu was said about keeping 23 to 25% oxygen. As you rightly said, the hyperoxia is not going to go beyond a certain level because the PaO2 is linked to your saturation. So if you give 23-25%, the episode of hypoxia may reduce. At the same time, you may be able to uh, keep them without going much into the desaturation episodes. So the question, these are more comments than questions, but the question is basically the histogram, I mean, the, the cutoff points, I mean, how defined are they? And I mean, do you think we should go for it based on your experience or I, I feel it's safer to wait rather than getting into medical legal problems. What do you think? Yes. So I, I don't, uh, the issue about, uh, there are a few questions. One is the medical legal, second, uh, uh, or you recommend about want to stop CPAP, go to high flow nasal cannula. So uh, let's talk about first CPAP to high flow nasal cannula. Uh, different patients are different. I have a baby myself that uh, was on CPAP and very distended abdomen, and we had difficulty in feeding that baby. And uh, as you know, the CPAP belly syndrome. So that baby, I wanted by all means, if I could go from uh, off CPAP as soon as I can. Uh, so we went earlier to high flow nasal cannula, but uh, no one says that high flow nasal cannula distends less the stomach than CPAP. CPAP, as we use it, it uh, uses the Bernoulli system where the flow switches uh, direction 
during inspiration towards baby, during expiration back out of baby, while the high flow nasal cannula does not have the Bernoulli system. And I don't know how much high flow nasal cannula, I don't know your comment or your uh, experience, uh, Dr. Dua and the whole team, does high flow nasal cannula cause less distended abdomen than uh, CPAP when used in a correct way where you keep 50% of the nostrils open? So I'm not sure that we gain into the feeding by going to, uh, to high flow nasal cannula. That's the first, question, first point. Second point, uh, you know, yes, uh, randomized control trial showed clearly that uh, initial uh, treatment with high flow nasal cannula produce half less benefit than CPAP. But uh, when they went to CPAP for versus high flow nasal cannula, they didn't find the difference. Yes, in numbers, but it doesn't seem logic to me if a 25 weaker was needing so much the CPAP on day one, day two of life, and because we extubate quickly on day two of life or so to CPAP, then we say, okay, no, go to high flow nasal cannula because the literature said so. Because uh, high flow nasal CPAP, uh, it's shown that prevents RDS of prematurity. Uh, not only treated. So I would like to extend as much as possible high flow nasal cannula. We might, not everyone will agree to keep it till 30 weeks or 32 weeks gestation. You might go to 28 weeks, you might go to 29 weeks, but I would go against going out of CPAP by 28 weeks, I would say, below 28 weeks. I, I'd like the comments of before we progress into other points of our other colleagues also, what do they think about moving from CPAP to high flow nasal cannula at which yeah. just... Like, I think we both agree that they need some form of pressure, but what our use, I mean, it depends on the nursing experience in the unit and overall, I mean, have a low threshold to switch back if you think, because de-recruitment is dangerous in these babies, you would end up giving them more than they need before. So careful watching and switching quickly is a key, but uh, I invite uh, Dr. Dua and uh, other colleagues, Dr. Ada, Dr. Dua, do you have any comments? Dr. Sidar. I think um, also the definition, uh, what's our definition of high flow in Isaac Canada? Like for example, a flow of five liter per minute for a baby who's uh, one kilo is different from flow of five liter for a baby who's, uh, who's bigger, like 1.5 or two kilo. So, so the different, some, uh, some people that define the high flow in Isaac Canada is one is around 1.5 to two um, liter per kilo. Uh, as per definition. And so uh, for us, as Dr. Sridhar uh, mentioned here, uh, we have found um, uh, nasal CPAP causes um, uh, nasal septal injury. And this is, this is the only concern from uh, uh, changing CPAP into high flow nasal cannula. And sometimes we use the interface, uh, the high flow nasal cannula interface just to prevent the nasal uh, septal injury. Yes, thank you. You know, we, we had before, but uh, I'd say in a year time, I might have one nasal injury, uh, maybe in two, I don't know, but uh, very rare, honestly, those days, you know, nurses become so skillful and uh, they move from uh, nasal prongs to nasal mask uh, every three hours. Uh, so uh, preventing and uh, they have a protocol for preventing it. I'm not saying it is not there. It's absolutely there and it happens. Fair enough. So this is uh, any other comment before I progress? Uh, discuss the legal aspect. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Yeah, please. Yeah. So the legal point, I think the, uh, my problem is not, uh, my problem is with my colleagues who are judging me, not uh, with the legal issue itself, because legally, uh, people will judge you on where the literature, what is the evidence in the literature. The only problem, like I come to judge you, but I don't know well the subject and I come with my own pre-made idea. So the best way to, to prevent or treat uh, legal issues is to have more talks about the subjects for people to, to understand the depth of it. Like myself, when I bought, I have my experiences, not so much. It's one month and a half or more than you because I bought the machines one and a half months to maybe less ago. So the point is uh, when I start using it, uh, 
and they found that uh, so many actions that seem, they seem totally logic, didn't make a difference. Then if I am to judge somebody based on the histogram, I will be uh, more reasonable. But if somebody didn't know it and he start reading 20% DSAT and he says, doctor, 20% of a day is 20% uh, of 24 hours, so many hours of DSAT and it's your problem. And it's, uh, so yes, and it's an issue. So my point is we need to educate each other uh, on on the subject and read educate ourselves and then there will be no legal issue in my opinion as long as you didn't do something wrong in the lit based on literature. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, uh, Sister Siba, Sam, uh, Dr. Tariq? The problem is multifactorial and often we treat it with one thing. So you you might have a baby as you said distended abdomen and that's giving him some discomfort. Another pain, baby, maybe because I did for him a heel prick and he's in pain or an arterial line or something. There are so many factors uh, and also the associated factors, anemia, hypoperfusion. So we come and treat with one element while many elements are related to including prematurity to the outcome. And one important point we need to stress to the team is the importance of, uh, I mean, how you mentioned procedures, for example, how the baby crying more or having the pain might cause them to de-recruit the lung. In a tiny baby, de-recruitment is a very big issue which can lead to more hypoxia if you keep the same setting. So we shouldn't hesitate, increase the pressure for one or two hours to recruit the lung and then step back again. That's that's probably the most important aspect. What you see, that, that baby whom I presented who had ROP, my treatment is certainly wrong. The patient is clearly straining. He strains so badly that he, he stops every flow of oxygen to his lung. So myself, I give him oxygen somehow, 23, 25, whatever it is. But he, if, his, if he was up in his larynx, he doesn't need my oxygen. I am treating straining by oxygen. At the end, I'm, I'm asking why it's not working. Why it's not working because try to find something to treat his straining if you could. Yes, and also to identify when you need to increase the pressure rather than the oxygen, because if you increase yeah, the pressure, your FAO2 may come down automatically. Yes. So uh, I think if there are no other questions, my uh, talk on jaundice, we will keep it another day. Maybe. Yeah, yes, Abu Hulwa, sorry. Yeah, just one question. Uh, how does the histogram affect them? Um, does it affect your discharge criteria? Like if you have a baby ex pre uh, for example, 25 weeker, now he's 10, he has some fleeting desats, we call it. Uh, it's um, less than 20% uh, of the time. So do you discharge this baby safely? It's very, very interesting uh, question. Um, you know, um, we have many, as you have many babies, they reach for home. And now the nurse keep telling you, doctor, he had five desaturations yesterday. That's even without the histogram. So uh, at the end, uh, two weeks ago, I was uh, doing a part of the unit, which is less acute, where there are more discharges. I discharged so many babies who were having desats, but those desats were with feeding. It was very clear. It was a DSAT only with feeding and a very minimal DSAT just very quickly. So deep DSAT with feeding, I don't want to discharge because you know you need to monitor, you might give feeding oxygen with, with feeding. Now, your question is not about that. Your question, what would you do if you have an unfavorable histogram and the patient is ready for discharge and he's not having apnea, he's not having anything and he's feeding. It didn't happen to me till now, but uh, I would say five, ten percent of desaturations uh, is normal when I start approaching, and if those desaturations are in the 88, 87, between 85 and 90, which doesn't hurt anyone, I would be, I would tend to let go. But if I see desaturations in the below 85, especially if I have other factors to consider, that you know, every one of uh, you would answer the same as me. I think. Uh, dependent of what other conditions the patient have and how he's ready. I would discharge a patient with few desaturations. Yes, it, it is an issue. I think I have a solution for that. When we stop the caffeine, you change them to the old pulse oximeter. <laughs> you stop saturation. You stop calculating the histogram. I mean, you just use the old pulse oximeter and we are applying the University of Pennsylvania. I mean, I don't know if you attended Professor Aikenwald's talk. I mean, the 
University of uh, Pennsylvania recommendations for discharge home and uh, they're also doing the study of desaturations at home and you're right I mean most babies would continue to have some desaturations but whether it is significant so it's more than uh, if it is less than 80 percent more than uh, 10 seconds or if there is uh, any need to support so uh, if there is very brief desaturation during feeding we don't worry. Yes, babies have periodic breathing and periodic breathing is by definition associated with uh, desat. All those babies in uh, the postnatal world who are term baby have uh, some episodic decrease of FiO2. If we put them on histogram and we record it and we act on it, it becomes a problem, yes. But I, I would be against also saying, I don't want to know. Uh, because uh, the more you know, the more you, you, you act better. Thank you. Any other questions? I think it has been an amazing session. And uh, obviously, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Fares for his time. I hope